Hi. Uh, in this lecture, uh, we will see about uh, stability and how to calculate, compute the stability and make an assessment about the stability of a system. Now, uh, you should all understand one thing that when we talk of stability of a multi-machine system, what we mean is the ability of all the generators to run in synchronism. Please understand that our electric grid has a number of alternators connected to it and they all have to run in synchronism. Now, every machine is protected both with an over frequency relay and an under frequency relay. So if it speeds up, then automatically the frequency will increase or if it slows down, the frequency will decrease. And these relays, depending on the threshold, which is set by the requirements of the grid code of a particular country, these relays will trip the generator. And the moment you trip a generator, you lose some supply or generation. And this can worsen matters. And in fact, it can lead to what we call as a cascading effect leading to a total blackout of the entire grid. So stability assessment is very, very important. And uh, we will first do for a simple case of a single machine in finite pass system. And you have already studied about, uh, seen about the equal area criteria, etc. in your previous semester. And now we will go uh, further and see how we can make a transient stability assessment using numerical solutions. This is Professor Umar Rao from RV Engineering College bringing you the lecture. So now we need to assess the stability of the system so we need to solve the swing equation. You're all familiar with the swing equation. The swing equation is basically given by MD squared delta by DT squared is equal to PM minus PE, where PM is the mechanical power input to the generator and P max sine delta is the electrical output of the generator. So the input power minus the output power will give you the acceleration. So if the mechanical power is more than the electrical output, then the machine will accelerate. Now the reverse, if the mechanical power is less than the electrical output, the machine will decelerate and slow down. And remember in an alternator, the frequency of the generated voltage is directly related to the speed. N is equal to 120 F by P. So if they're directly proportional, okay? So whatever changes you have in the speed of the generator is reflected in the frequency of the generated voltage, right? Under equilibrium, the mechanical power will be equal to the electrical power. So here you have to understand that for the transient stability analysis, that means a very short time after a disturbance occurs, the mechanical power is assumed to be a constant. Now, is this assumption valid? Definitely, because the time constant of the mechanical system, basically the turbines is large, so they do not change as fast as the load on the electrical side. So our disturbances come mainly because of rapid changes in the load or because of a load rejection or a sudden increase in the electrical load or due to electrical faults after the generator. So this is the swing equation and you can see here that because of the sine delta term it is a non-linear equation. Okay and it is impossible virtually to get a closed form expression for the uh, solution of the equation. Hence we have to resort to numerical methods and uh, in this session I will talk about a very popular method called the step-by-step -step method for the solution of the swing equation. So here M can be expressed in terms of the moment of inertia H, which is uh, 
given by mega joules per MPa, and you can express it in second square per degree electrical or second square per degree radian. So basically, what are we going to do when we say I solve for the swing equation? What I'll be doing is this. M is known. M is known. I know the initial angle of delta. I know the initial angle delta. P M is the mechanical power is known. P max is known. It depends on the network configuration. So essentially, when I say solve for the swing equation, what I mean is get the solution of delta with respect to time. Okay, so from the initial value of delta at time, at a known time, let us say at time t equal to zero, as time progresses, how does delta change? That is the solution of the swing equation. So now I have two situations. I have drawn two simple switch situations. So if, so x axis is time and uh, y axis is delta, let me assume delta naught is the initial value of the, of the uh, angle delta. This is a generator internal angle. Okay. Now it is a constant as long as there is no disturbance. And suddenly at time t equal to t naught, there is a disturbance. Now there are two possibilities that can occur after the disturbance. One is delta just increases with time. Okay. It just goes on increasing. And which means what? The internal angle increases means the velocity increases and the generator accelerates and your frequency will go on increasing. Okay, this is one possibility. And another possibility is delta increases because of the fault and then comes down. Okay, so uh, we call the first response as an unstable response. So how, how long do I have to simulate? I don't have to simulate for hours together, just a few seconds, okay? In a few seconds, you will be able to determine whether the angle will continue to increase or whether the angle will increase and come down. And from our equal area criteria, we know that if it starts coming down, then I can make my system stable by taking a control action if necessary. So I need to figure out what kind of response I'm going to get. So if I get a response like this, then I say the system has become unstable because of the disturbance. And if I get a second response where, you know, it, it goes up and comes down, I say I get a stable response. Okay. So this is called as first swing stability. That means in the first swing, swing is when there's a change. It goes and swings back. We call that as the first swing stability. And with all modern controllers, if you can ensure the first swing stability, then the, you can make the system stable by taking suitable control actions. So this is what we are going to see. So now we will see what is the step-by-step -step method for solution of the swing equation. In every method, every numerical method you use, understand there is some approximation and some assumption. So it only a closed form solution is perfect. Closed form solution means I get the expression, the mathematical expression for delta in terms of T or Y in terms of X. In the absence of a closed form solution, we resort to numerical methods and every numerical method will have some error. So as long as the error is acceptable, the results are acceptable. So in this particular method, I'll be dealing in this session, that is the step-by-step -step method, or it's also called as the point-by-point -point method. Let us see what assumptions I'm making. So the first assumption I'm making is that the acceleration power I compute at the beginning of an interval is assumed to be constant from the middle of the preceding interval to the next interval. Okay, what do I mean by an interval? So in all numerical methods, you'll be using some discrete form of solution. That means you know the solution at the time t naught of the dependent variable. And then using this, you find an algorithm to find what is the value at t naught plus delta t that we call as the next time step. So in all numerical methods, your algorithm proceeds as follows. 
how do you compute the value of the dependent variable in the next time step with knowledge of the current time step or how do i compute the dependent variable at the current time step if i know what is the value at the previous time step okay so i here the assumption i am making is that the accelerating power is a constant from the middle of one interval to the middle of the next time interval so essentially you would plot it like this so let us say n is the current interval n minus 1 is the previous that is the time t minus delta t at that time and n minus 2 is at the previous time interval so my x axis you see i have plotted it as t by delta t that means how many delta t's have you completed okay and now we'll see how the plot goes so from the middle of the preceding interval to the middle of the succeeding interval the accelerating power is a constant so my discrete solution looks like this a stepped curve whereas a continuous one is a curve like this so continuous i can get only if i know the closed form expression so i can get that for any value of t in the absence of which i have to resort to a discrete solution and this is the assumption i make about the accelerating power and next the angular velocity omega that is d delta by dt here the velocity we are talking of is the velocity above the synchronous velocity omega s or omega not okay not the absolute speed that is the change in delta the change in delta what is the change in velocity it would bring about in the angular velocity that's what we are talking about we assume it to remain a constant throughout any interval computed at the value of the middle of the interval so you see i compute it at the middle so this dot i have shown i compute it there and i assume it's a constant throughout the interval okay so i compute it at n minus half to show that it's the middle of an interval and whatever i compute i assume it to be a constant from n minus 1 to n so these assumptions are just to get some equations to start off my computation okay and the changes in the angles are represented as below get familiar with the nomenclature so every discrete interval is assumed at uniform intervals and the interval in terms of time is delta t seconds delta t seconds so at the nth interval i call it as delta n and at n minus 1 i call it as delta n minus 1 and the change in this angle i denote it by delta here this represents the change in the angle delta and similarly the change between any two succeeding intervals i can represent as follows i have shown here a raising graph which means the angle increases with time it need not be the for certain faults the generator can decelerate also this is only illustrative okay fine so now let us see how we take off so let us consider the nth time interval which begins at a time t equal to n minus 1 into delta t now the angular position of the delta at this point is delta n minus 1 of the rotor so what am i doing i am taking the nth interval and i'm saying the angular position at this time is delta n minus 1 i know that the accelerating power depends on the acceleration so acceleration i have represented as alpha remember i have three parameters here one is delta which is the angular position one is omega which is d delta by dt there is a change in the angular position gives me the angular velocity another is alpha which is the angular of acceleration which is what is acceleration change in the velocity so alpha is d omega by dt okay so i have delta i have omega i have alpha so i assume the accelerating power and hence the acceleration is calculated and it is assumed to be constant remember we assume the accelerating power and hence the acceleration is constant 
from middle of one interval to the middle of the next interval. So since it is at n minus one, the preceding interval middle would be n minus three by two, and the next interval would be n minus half. So I'm assuming the accelerating power is a constant from n minus three by two delta t to n minus half delta t. Okay, so during this interval, acceleration is a constant, right? So if acceleration is a constant, the rotor speed will change, the velocity will change. So I denote it as delta omega n minus half. Okay, it's a notation, that's all. You can refer to the graphs. What is change in velocity? It is time changing time into acceleration. Okay, so changing time is delta t and acceleration is alpha n minus one. So during this interval, the change in the velocity is given by this. And what is acceleration? Acceleration is, remember, it is d omega by dt, d omega by dt, and from the swing equation, d omega by dt is nothing but pa by m, pa by m, that is your swing equation, okay? And here, I take the interval n minus 1, so I have delta t and pa n minus 1 by m, this is my acceleration. Okay, and what is this? This is my change in the velocity. Now, what will be the speed? The speed at the nth interval will be, that is omega n minus half, the speed at the preceding middle of the interval plus the change in the speed. Clear? In discrete solutions, it is always the new value is the old value plus the change, obviously. So omega n minus half is the speed at the middle of the next interval. That will be the speed at the middle of the previous interval plus the change in the speed from current to the previous. So in other words, the speed assumed to be a constant at this value throughout the nth interval from time t equal to n minus one delta t to t equal to n delta t. T. We assume the speed is constant throughout the interval and the accelerating power is constant from the preceding half to the next half. Okay, so this speed which I call omega n minus half is constant. So where is omega n minus half? It's in between n minus 1 and n. In between n minus 1 and n. So it is assumed to be a constant in that interval. Okay. So if you want, I can go back and show you. Yeah, just see here. This is omega n minus half, which I compute. It is constant throughout the interval, throughout the interval, okay? And between this interval and the previous interval, I'm going to represent, I'm going to find out. This is what I found out, the change in the speed. Okay, so now that I know this, let's see how I can use it. What? I actually, my objective is to find delta, please remember that. So, now I know the change in the speed. Now let me see what is the change in the angular position of the rotor, all right? So I need to find the change in the angle at the interval n. So what will be the change in the angle? The change in the angle is delta t, that is a small time period you have taken, into omega n minus half because omega is a constant during that interval from n minus one to n. And omega is d delta by dt, okay? Therefore, the change in the angle will be equal to the time change delta t into omega, omega n minus half. This is a constant in that time period. So now let us do some manipulation. Do I know omega n minus half? Yes, I have calculated omega n minus half. I have calculated it as omega n minus three by two plus delta omega n minus half. Okay, so I am substituting for omega n minus half here with what I have shown in the bracket. And this delta t remains. So now what is omega n minus three by two? into delta t I have and what is delta omega n minus half? Delta omega n minus half is 
we have calculated it in the previous slide. You just see here, delta omega n minus half is omega n minus three by two into delta omega n minus half. And what is this? This is delta t by m into p a n minus one. So I have to substitute this term here. Okay, so that's what I do and I get so you see here I have substituted for omega n minus half and now I'm going to substitute for delta omega n minus half which is delta t into p a n minus 1 by m and I already have a delta t here so this becomes delta t squared by m p a n minus 1. And in the similar fashion I can write delta the change in delta in the interval n minus 1 is equal to delta t and instead of omega n minus half, it is omega n minus 3 by 2, right? And so if I just see here delta t omega n minus 3 by 2, I have not used any substitution here. I have not used any substitution here. What have I done here? I have just substituted n as n minus 1. So n becomes n minus 1. So n minus half becomes n minus 3 by 2. And in this expression, I have delta t omega n minus 3 by 2 is the change in the angle at n minus 1 interval. So I get a nice equation. This is the change in the angle in the current interval is equal to change in the angle in the previous interval plus delta t squared by m into the accelerating power in the previous interval. Okay, such a relationship is called as a recursive relationship. I use it recursively for different values of n. Okay, and the value of delta is what I want to find. It is simply the previous value of delta plus the change in the value of delta. Clear? So I have a set of equations. If I show you the example, you will understand how to apply the equations. Is it clear? Okay. So what have I done here? I start off with a known value of delta naught. That is the initial value of delta naught. And, <coughs> excuse me, using this, I find out what are the subsequent values of delta using a recursive relationship. So now let's see an example. Before that, any switching event is a fault. Okay. And uh, the fault can be sustained. Sustained means nobody clears the fault. There is a short circuit and the short circuit continues for some time. We call it as a sustained fault. Or the breaker clears the fault, right? So as far as the system is considered, the occurrence of a fault and the clearance of a fault, both are disturbances, okay? Both are disturbances. So any switching event will cause a discontinuity in the accelerating power, okay? Because the P max will change. Once there is a fault, the network configuration itself will change. Say, supposing you have two lines, parallel lines, and a fault removes one line because a breaker opens, then the X changes, the value of X changes. And P max, if you take a simple SMIB system, single machine infinite bus system, is simply E1, E2 by X, okay? So if X changes, P max will change, and if P max changes, the accelerating power will change. So accelerating power, uh, any change will cause a discontinuity in the accelerating power. Now, if the discontinuity occurs at the beginning of the interval, right, what have we assumed? We have assumed that the accelerating power is a constant from the middle of one interval to the middle of the next interval, right? So I take the average of the two values of PA. That means before the fault occurs or the disturbance occurs and after the disturbance occurs, immediately after the disturbance occurs. And if the discontinuity occurs at the middle of an interval, then I don't need to do any adjustment because I am anyway calculating the accelerating power. 
at the middle of the interval. So you don't have to do any adjustment. So these are just simple matters <coughs> which can improve your solution. Now let's uh, take up an example. So I have a 20 MVA 50 Hertz generator delivering 18 megawatts over a double circuit line and the H is 2.52 megajoules per MVA at the rated speed and the generator transient reactance is 0.35 okay resistance is neglected each line has a 0.2 per unit reactance and the generator voltage is 1.1 per unit and infinite bus voltage is 1 per unit a three phase short circuit occurs at the midpoint one of one of the transmission lines and plot the swing curves with fault cleared by simultaneous opening of the breakers. So if it opens at 2.5 cycles, what happens? If it opens at 6.25 cycles, what happens? So you can just see this. Okay. Now, fine. I will be using this for illustrating other methods also like Rangekuta and Euler method in the subsequent uh, lectures. So, This I have calculated for the RK method. This initial calculations is the same for any method. So first you calculate M, that is H by pi F. So that is 0 0.016 second square per electrical radian. And then you do the pre-fault calculations. Before the fault, what do I have? I have that, what is the impedance, reactance, between the generator and the infinite bus. So I have the generator reactance which is 0.35 and I have two lines each of 0.2 per unit in parallel. So the parallel impedance will be 0.2 by 2. So the total reactance is 0.45 per unit. Okay. Now so PE1 that is before the fault P max 1 sine delta P max is EV by X sine delta E is 1.1, e, V is 1, and X is 0.45, so I have 2.44 sine delta. This is the expression for the electrical power before the fault. And we have said it is supplying 18 megawatts, it's an 18 megawatt generator, and the base is 20 MVA. Therefore, the power transfer before the fault is 18 by 20, which is 0.9 per unit. Right. So before the fault occurs, the generator is transferring 0.9 per unit to the infinite bus. Now this would obviously be the mechanical power PM also because why? Before the fault, the electrical power and the mechanical power are the same. So it is equal to PM. So this value of PM will remain constant throughout our calculations because in transient stability analysis, we assume the mechanical power input to be a constant. Now, during the fault, during the fault, what happens? It is 1.1 into 1 divided by 1.25. So how did I get this 1.25? Just look at this. What happens? The short circuit occurs at the midpoint of one of the transmission lines. So you have two lines in parallel. You have two lines in parallel and you have to find out what is the impedance at the midpoint. So you have to do some sort of a star delta transformation and then calculate it. And if you do that, you get a reactance of 1.25, which is which gives me 0.88 sine delta. So this is the expression during the fault. Next, after the fault is cleared, post fault, what happens? One line is removed. One line is removed. So what is the reactance? I have the generator reactance is 0.35, and the reactance of one line 0.2. So 0.35 plus 0.2 is 0.55. So I get PE3 is 2 sine delta. Now, I need the initial angle. Please remember in all the numerical methods, I need the initial solution. 
So initially it is supplying 0.9, okay? So I have 2.44 sine delta naught is equal to 0.9. The, the expression is 2.44 sine delta, right? And so what should be the angle? What should be the angle to supply a power of 0.9? So from this expression, I get delta naught is equal to 21.64 degrees or it is 0.378 radians and omega naught is equal to zero. Don't think that the machine is stationary because omega is zero. No. Here, remember, I told you omega is the change in speed over and above the synchronous speed. Okay, fine. So these are the calculations you have to do, whether you do a step-by-step -step method or the RK method or the Euler's method, or you can use bisection, prediction method, any method. This, these calculations are independent of the method you use. So now let us see how I do the calculations using the swing equations uh, which we saw. So these are the equations we derived. Pa n minus 1 is equal to Pm. In our case, Pm is 0.9. P max. So you should use the correct value of P max for if you are using it before the fault or during the fault or after the fault, right? So the correct value of P max has to be used depending on the time. And then P derived this. The change in the angle at the current time interval is equal to the change in the previous interval plus delta T squared by M P A N minus one. And using this, I update the value of delta. So you see here how the recursion occurs. What, what is the calculation you require to start off? I need to, to first I need to find PA n minus one. So I start at the beginning, the first interval. So I need to know sine delta at the first interval, which is your initial angle we calculated, which is, which I represented as delta zero. That is when n is equal to one, the first instant. That is my initial angle before the fault. Okay, that's how you start off. So your initial point for starting is delta naught. You need the value of delta naught. Then you, how do you start the process? Calculate PA. First calculate PA n minus one. Calculate PA. So for that you need to know P max. P max you have already calculated for the three in three sections of time zones before the fault, during the fault, and after the fault. So calculate the accelerating power using the respective P max, depending on the time interval. Then calculate delta N, right? And then you calculate the change in the angle delta N, and then using that, you update the value of the angle. Now you have the new value of the angle, go back. That's why we call it as recursive. Calculate the accelerating power, calculate the change in angle, and then calculate the delta in the next time step. So you go on and on as time proceeds. All that you need here is the initial angle of delta. Clear? So now let's see how to do it. Okay, I'll just show you example. So let us assume that the fault occurs at t equal to zero. That means a fault at the middle of the line, there's a short circuit, okay? So there is a discontinuity at the beginning of the interval. What does this mean? At t is equal to zero, there is a fault means. At t equal to zero minus, that means the instant just before the fault, the system is good. And at t is equal to zero plus, there is a faulted condition. That's the meaning, okay? Fine. Now, I have to use, you remember when, when a fault occurs at the beginning of an interval, we have to use the average value of PA. Okay, fine. Now, PA, zero minus. What is zero minus? Just before the fault. What will be the accelerating power? It will be zero because the system is under steady state. Or you can use the initial value of delta naught. That's how we calculate it. And uh, so before the fault, so zero minus is just an indication, okay? Just before that time. So the accelerating power is zero, okay? Now, 
immediately after the fault occurs, I denote it as PA0 plus. What is my expression for accelerating power? It is PM minus P max sine delta. Delta, I have to use delta naught. That is at the previous interval. What do I know? Delta naught, right? Delta naught we have already calculated. It is 21.64 degrees. This is the pre-fault value. Clear? I'm just starting off from the instant the fault occurs. And during the fault, you know, the maximum power is 0.88. So I calculate and I get 0.576 per unit. Okay. Now I take the average value of both. So it is 0 plus 0.576 by 2. It is 0.288 per unit. Right. Now, what is my change? So I have, you are in your recursive relationship. The first thing is you have to calculate the average accelerating power. Okay, or the accelerating power, in this case, average because a disturbance occurs. So I calculate delta, change in delta. So I have delta, delta n minus one, which is the change in the previous time interval, which is zero, obviously, because I don't have any change initially. So I calculated, calculate that. This first term is zero. Delta t, I'm assuming as 0 0.05. You can assume any value you want. If you assume a smaller time interval, you will have more calculations, but more accurate. If you use a larger time interval, accuracy will be reduced. Just for illustration, I have taken 0 0.05. So I have 0 0.05 square divided by M is 0 0.016 and PA I have calculated is 0.288. So I get 0 0.045 radians which is equal to 2.58 degrees. So the change in your rotor angle is 2.58 degrees. Then the third equation, I use this. What is this? This is my previous angle. That is delta n minus one. That is a delta zero plus change, 2.58. Delta, the change at the first interval we have calculated is 2.58. So it is 24.22 degrees. Okay, now how do you proceed? I know, I know the angle now. Now you take this angle 24.22 and substitute here because PM doesn't change. Remember, this will be 0.9. And in the next one, anyway, there is no disturbance in the next time step. So you calculate 0.9 minus 0.88 sine of this, you will get PA. Using that value of PA, you calculate the change in the angle and then again update and go on doing it. Okay, this is the value of delta at time t equal to point seconds. So in the next time interval, I'm showing you how you calculate what I told you. So I calculate PA, there is no average because there is no disturbance. And then I calculate delta change, which is equal to 0 0.129 radians. Okay, and then I calculate the new angle that is delta at 0 0.1 seconds, I get 31.62 degrees. So you proceed, you proceed. Okay, so I'll just show you sustained fault means, as I told you, the fault is not cleared. So you can make a table. You can make a table. So just see here, I have P max at zero minus, this is before the fault, P max is 2.44. And at zero plus, the fault occurs. And during the fault, P max is 0.88. I am taking a sustained fault, means fault is not cleared at all. So throughout P max will remain the same. Okay, and you calculate PA, PA, and only in this case you take the average for the first one because the fault occurs, and you have the change in the angle, and add it to the previous, this is the previous angle, if you add it, you get the new value of delta. Okay, and so this is the value of angle at 0 0.05. Take this value of delta, calculate the new value of PA, and then calculate the new value of delta. Add these two, you get delta in the next time step and so on, you proceed, okay? So now, let us say the fault is cleared at 2.5 cycles, 2.5 cycles. So at uh, 50 Hertz, it will be 50 milliseconds. That is 0 0.05 seconds. Now let, us, let me draw your attention to the P max here. 
So zero minus it is two point four four healthy system. Zero plus fault occurs. My next time step is point zero five. I have taken. So at point zero five, the fault is cleared. So point zero five minus the fault persists. It is zero point eight eight. And at point zero five plus fault is cleared. After the fault is cleared, the maximum power is two. I have shown you how to calculate the maximum power previously, right? So only this you have to fill up correctly, depending on when the fault is cleared. The rest is exactly the same. There is absolutely no change. Only thing is when you come here, when you come to this point, you calculate P A using point eight eight and this angle of delta, and again you calculate P A using two. As p max, and then take the average, because here also the fault is clear, right? So I told you whether occurrence of a fault or clearance of a fault, both are viewed as disturbances. Okay, and then just continue, continue the same way. Now let us take another case: six point two five cycles. So on a fifty hertz, it is point one two five seconds. So you see, I go on. Making and now this occurs. Point one two five seconds is in the middle of an interval, right? It is here. It is in between point one and point one five. So at point one there is a fault. At point one five the fault is clear. Now you contrast this with the previous case where at point zero five it is clear. So point zero five minus Fault is persistent. Point zero five plus it is cleared. Whereas here, at the previous time interval, it is there. Next time, it is cleared. So it occurs. The clearance of the fault occurs. The disturbance occurs in between two time steps. You don't have to take the average. Just continue. So you have here. You have this value of angle. Use that and use this value of P max to calculate P A and continue. Okay. So. You see, I have a simple recursive equation. All that you do, the need to apply this method is calculate the initial value of delta. Omega initial will always be zero because delta will be a constant as long as the disturbance doesn't occur. Okay, so you need only you need the initial value of delta, and you need to calculate the. P max values at different zones before the fault, during the fault, after the fault, and for a sustained fault, the fault persists and the fault is not clear, and the fault is not clear. That's all. Once you know this, you just have to use the three equations. Very simple computation, and you can go on solving for delta. So now you see, I can plot whatever I've shown you in the table. I have plotted. So for a sustained fault. You can see that the angle delta increases continuously. We have simulated it for 0.6 seconds. That's all. Maximum you have to simulate for about one or two seconds. You will know whether the generator is going to be stable or unstable. So this is an unstable case. Obviously, a short circuit occurs and it's not cleared. Now at 2.5 cycles, it goes to a maximum and comes back. 2.5 cycles, the fault is cleared. And at 6.25 cycles, it goes to a higher angle and still comes back. So now you can see, I if I go on increasing the clearance time. So from 6.25 cycles, let us say I assume eight cycles, ten cycles. You can easily guess what's going to happen to this curve. It is going to shift up, up until at one time it will not come back. It will simply go on increasing. That is called as the critical clearing time. So you have got some expressions for critical clearing time. Okay, that you can you can get a closed form expression only for simple systems. You have done some critical clearing angle and all that. That you can't do all the time. Okay, only for a simple SMIB system you can do. But for any other system, what you have to do is you go on increasing the clearing time. And as you increase, the swing becomes bigger and bigger until at one clearing time it will not come back; it will just shoot up. That is the critical clearing time. So you can find out the critical clearing time from simulation studies by this method. Okay. 
Thank you. In the next lecture, I will show you the Rangikuta method.